Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, the headlines, as usual, 13-year-old um, allegations against British troops, including an SAS hero, it says on the Mail on Sunday, make the front pages of a couple of papers. There's the Mail on Sunday, as I said. Um, the same story makes the front of the Sunday Telegraph. There it is. Army outrage at betrayal of Iraqi war troops. Uh, the Sunday Times has that story you were hearing about in the news. Old Bozza writing one more column than he expected to be published. <laughs> My case for Britain to stay in Europe, we'll talk about that in a moment. And also you may notice here that select committee report attacking the Labour Party for making a, sp a safe space for anti-Semitism. Again, we'll be discussing that and much more in the paper review. But let's just start off, Lucy, if we could, with the, the Bozza story, which is, I think, possibly the one that's giving us most amusement this morning. Yes, absolutely. And I've got to say, it's not much cop. As a Remain campaigner, if he'd have come out with that, I'm not sure it would have convinced many people. And I think what it does tell us is that this was a decision about the leadership. He starts the piece with asking whether David Cameron thinks the renegotiation is enough. Half of it is basically, is the renegotiation enough? The end is, I can't bring myself to back him. So purely this is a political calculation. It wasn't about, is this about what is best for the country? Is it what's going to be best for the economy? He sort of slips in the fact that it could lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom, it could lead to Russian aggression. There could be some really serious consequences, but for me, this is politics. And we, but we should say it's perfectly reasonable to try to lay out the argument in two different ways. A bit of throat clearing before you finally decide which way you're going to jump. Most unfortunate from his point of view, the Sunday Times has now obtained, Tim Shipman's obtained the piece and printed it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this, uh, now that we can read Boris's column, which was never published, I mean, that's not news. We, we knew that he'd written these two columns. That, that revelation came yeah. out yonks ago. Um, but it, now that we can actually read it, we can see that uh, he, he couldn't really persuade himself that, that coming out for Remain was ever a good idea. I mean, it contains passages like, uh, we said that if we failed to get reform, then Britain would have a great future outside. We have not got a reformed EU, so nothing for it then. Ho for the open seas. Viva Brexit. That would seem to be the logic. And he concludes by saying, yes, folks, the Prime Minister's deal's a bit of a dud. So it seems to me that uh, this actually uh, corroborates rather than uh, in any way undermines Boris's account, which is he tried to write this column to see if he could find a way to make the argument for Remain, and he really couldn't. But the sad thing is, none of it is about the detail. None of it is, OK, what does life outside the EU actually look like? Nobody thought about that. There was no sort of thinking of, is, will prices go up, what will happen to jobs? It's purely, is the renegotiation enough? And actually, yeah. is the status quo the right thing, not what does life outside well, look like? The detail that follows is what is now obsessing the House of Commons and the courts and all the rest of it. And we, we must talk, I think the, the mirror, the, the son, I beg your pardon, Toby, has a piece about this coalition building up in the House of Commons to put Theresa May on the spot. Yes, um, it's, it's the story of the hour, which I believe you'll be talking to Nick Clegg about later, uh, which is an attempt by various promoters to cobble together a cross-party parliamentary alliance to try and insist on a vote on what the Brexit strategy should be. My problem with this isn't just that, you know, this is the third attempt now by the Bremoners to try and block Brexit. Which First of all, it was... Bremoners are <laughs> Remainers. Remainers were moaning, were moaning about I the see. outcome okay, of right. the no. largest uh, democratic uh, event in Britain's history. Um, uh, I mean, the, the first attempt was uh, uh, there should be a vote before we trigger Article 50. I think, uh, and that's still wending its way through the courts, but it doesn't look like that's going to help their cause much, because even if there is a vote, I think a majority of MPs will vote to trigger Article 50. Then there was the Owen Smith attempt, there should be a vote uh, uh, once we know the terms of the deal before we finally pull the trigger after Article 50 has been, been, been triggered. And now there's this attempt, the third attempt, which is there ought to be a parliamentary vote on the terms in which well, Theresa May negotiates. Well, actually, Isn't it reasonable for people to say, well, we voted to leave the EU, but quite what that means is not clear, and that therefore there are issues which MPs have the right to discuss? I think the problem with this is that if MPs decide uh, that they're going to reject a hard Brexit and that Theresa May should take that off the table before going into the negotiation. That's like sending her into a boxing ring with one hand tied behind her back. If she can't threaten a hard Brexit, she's much less likely to get concessions on freedom of movement, for instance, uh, than if she can. So why hobble her going into this process? But there's a ferocious um, attack on, on people like Toby in the Observer's 
editorial this morning and a defence of the, these blockheads, as the Sun describes them in the, in the House of Commons. Absolutely, and I think what I would say is that it is the ultimate irony that a campaign that was based on making our Parliament great, more sovereignty for the UK, more democratic accountability, but actually, as you say, the biggest decision constitutionally this country has taken, you don't want Parliament to have a say because it's a bit inconvenient, and actually the details of what out might look like would be gone over. Now, I do understand that showing your hand early can potentially have an impact on the negotiations. But this is such a huge decision. And calling all of us Ramonas, when all we care about, frankly, is that this country gets the best possible deal, accepting the result. But what does that deal look like? Because none of your friends on the Leave campaign saw, saw fit to work out a plan and say, what actually will the deal be? Well, and hard Brexit is a lot worse were... than a softer Brexit. Lucy, we knew what they were against. I mean, I can remember vividly saying to Michael Gove, does this mean that we are outside the single market? And he said, absolutely, yes. I mean, we, those things were clear, and it was clear, surely, in the course of the referendum campaign, that people, if they were voted to leave, were voting to take back control over immigration. Do that, then you cannot be a member of the single market. That's what they all say. And therefore, quite a lot of this is pretty clear, and it pushes us towards a hard Brexit, not a soft one, except, to use the jargon. Except for those implications mean prices going up and falling back on WTO tariffs. Um, this week, there was somebody on the news, it was absolutely heartbreaking, he said, why did nobody warn us prices would go up? Well, I'm afraid we tried, and we were told it was project fear. Well, actually, these are the real implications, and I'm really sorry that people will see their cost of living go up. We're already seeing it with food, petrol and other things. And that's the sadness. People Jeremy. voted for something. They voted for £350 million a week for the NHS. And sadly, that's not going to happen. Um, I think it's pretty clear what we voted for. We voted to leave the European Union and this latest tactic, even though people like Clegg say, we're not opposing that, we just want to have a vote on how to negotiate it. It's clearly, it's a blocking tactic by those who are unhappy about the fact entirely. that they lost the referendum. It's democracy, one of the, one of the curiosities of this new tactic is that they're now emphasising that the reason Leavers voted to leave was because they care passionately about parliamentary sovereignty. Until now, they've accused us of being racist, but finally they're acknowledging, because it's in their interest to acknowledge, that it is actually more about parliamentary sovereignty than it is about immigration. But I'd say to you, Lucy, in making this point, uh, there will be an opportunity for Parliament to vote. They'll be able to vote on the Great Repeal Bill. So it's not as if that principle is yeah. at stake here. There will be a parliamentary vote on Brexit. But it's Let, not let's on the detail. Let's return to a couple of the actual stories, if we may, which is, you've, you've chosen <laughs> Janet Daly, first of all, mm. in the Sunday Telegraph there. Tell us yeah, about Yeah, I mean, it, it's a bit more of the same, really. It's just saying it's Project Fear Mark II and all the rest of it. And I it's pretty sad that the level of debate has got to this, where you can't have a decent grown-up discussion about, OK, what are the terms? Um, again, if people didn't feel they fully understood the facts during the campaign, there should be a proper debate. Um, and the fact that we're sort of labelled Ramonas and, and all the rest of it, actually, there should be scrutiny. And let's try and grow up a little bit, because it's got really divisive. What, well, you say it's got divisive. Lots of us sit around talking about it, but this has actually reached the Cabinet level now. There's a spread in the Mail on Sunday there suggesting that we could be about to lose the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, who's now angry about the way he has been excluded from meetings and so forth. Yeah, he is leading the so-called soft Brexit side of the Yes, argument. I mean, this, this, uh, this, this story is that um, uh, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, uh, is irritated because he's been excluded from various critical meetings at which the Brexit negotiating strategy has been discussed and that he may resign if his views aren't taken mm. into account in future. This, look, this feels like a leak from the new cross-party rebel alliance trying to strengthen their hand. You must, you must uh, listen to us and have a parliamentary vote, otherwise you, you risk uh, prominent Remainers in the cabinet resigning and the government mm. splitting. But we, what, we, what we do know from this week, however, is that Theresa May's Brexit subcommittee of the cabinet is evenly divided between Remainers and Brexiteers. It's been very, very carefully done. She seems to be trying desperately to hold the line between the two groups. Mm -hmm. Well, ultimately, it has to be conducted taking on board all of those concerns. Philip Hammond has met with a lot of business and knows from his time at the Foreign Office also about a lot of the practicality. So it's absolutely right that he should be there and that those concerns of businesses are taken into account. Let's move on, if we could, to the other big political story of the day, which is the Home Affairs Select Committee 
has attacked um, the Labour Party for, and, and indeed many other people, for allowing anti-Semitism to grow in this country. It's on the front page of both the Sunday Telegraph and the Sunday Times, uh, and it's inside the Observer. You've got the story there, Toby. Yes, um, uh, it's a story in, in the Observer, which is usually a story reasonably friendly to Labour, uh, and it reports this uh, investigation by the Home Affairs Select Committee into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, and it's a damning report um, uh, which, uh, which uh, refers to uh, various anti-Semitic incidents which have been insufficiently investigated within the Labour Party and it also criticises Shemi Chakrabarti for her whitewash and calls into question again what the timeline was of her being offered a period yes. and whether that she, was an incentive. She has been on this programme and has said absolutely she was not offered the, uh, the peerage before doing the, the, uh, uh, the inquiry. Um, nobody's suggesting I think that, that uh, Jeremy Corbyn's anti-Semitic himself, but this is all to do with really the Israeli-Palestinian issue, isn't it? It's people who are um, very passionately pro-Palestinian going over the line and starting to talk about Zios. Yes, I mean, I, I think the, 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 the Corbyn defence has always mm. been that uh, there's a difference between being anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic. But the problem is, I think the, the elision that takes place amongst the Corbynistas is that anything which is critical of Israel, even if it is uh, often anti-Semitic, is fine uh, because there is this difference between being anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic. But it, I think, yeah. does need them yeah. to turn a blind eye well, gonna, to what they should be We're going to talk to Tim Loughton, who is the, who's the acting chair of the committee after this, I hope. Um, but before we do that, we must turn to uh, the other part of the political agenda, which is, which is Scotland. We're going to be talking yeah. to Nicola Sturgeon later on. And she is now bringing forward legislation in the Scottish Parliament for a second independence referendum in Scotland if she doesn't get what she wants on our, our kind of Brexit. Yes. Oh, you've got a, you've yeah, got it's the, in the, the Scottish Herald. Scottish um, Herald, which we can see yeah, on, on your that, iPad. That there. she wants to trigger another, another referendum. And, I mean, I can completely understand. I sort of feel like she got the outcome she wanted uh, from the referendum, and it allows um, for Nicola Sturgeon to call for this second She'd referendum. She'd be cross to hear you say that. Well, I mean, she did, she did campaign, let's be fair, in the campaign. She didn't necessarily agree with the kind of campaign that we ran. She thought it was a bit too much like Project Fear. Um, but I think what's interesting is... Is, is she that said, well? Um, it was we were setting out the risks. As she we, said. As we she, saw she, them. she said to me uh, on air. She said the one thing I must warn these people is don't try and rerun Project Fear because it doesn't work and you'll get the wrong answer. And that's what happened. It could be said. Well, I'm, I, it's it's a terribly sad thing that, that that did happen. But but what's interesting here is that opinion hasn't changed. So there isn't actually in Scotland more support for independence. I mean, anecdotally, some yes. friends of mine have said. It does make me think differently, because let's remember the EU membership was a huge deal in the first referendum, so there will have been people who voted to remain part of the UK as a result of keeping in the EU. But actually, the opinion poll suggests that there's less support for independence now than there was in 2014. I don't find these threats particularly credible, partly because there is less support. So if there was another uh, Scottish referendum, they'd lose by a bigger margin, but also because I don't buy this idea that if Scotland becomes independent of the UK, it could somehow retain its membership That's of the an EU. That's absolutely crucial question. It, it isn't would it? surely not be able to do that. Spain would kick up the most almighty fuss because that would give uh, uh, additional incentives for the Basque separatists. Uh, much more likely is if they, they'd become a kind of orphan state, not part of the Union, not part of the EU. Who's going to pay their massive welfare bills in that scenario? So I don't think it's a credible threat. Um, now, as I came into the building, the only thing that people were asking was, have you got Donald Trump on the programme? As <laughs> if. But it's what everyone wants to talk about. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a story uh, on page 18 of the Sunday Telegraph um, uh, summarising all the uh, accusations of sexual assault that have been yeah. made by various women since Trump categorically denied that he had sexually assaulted anyone in the debate uh, last week. Um, what I find one of the extraordinary aspects of this story um, is that Trump is so cross with the New York Times for running an account of two of these women that he has threatened the New York Times with a libel suit. This is a man, let's not forget, who described every US Mexican immigrant as a rapist and a criminal. He's now accusing the New York Times of libeling it him. It sounds to me, this is if he's going slightly do lally, let's put it put it bluntly. He's now suggesting that Hillary Clinton was on a performance enhancing drugs at the last <laughs> debate and his people are now saying this debate is, the, the, the election is going to be fixed, it'll be an unfair election. Um, there's a, a kind of 
an air of desperation and nastiness beginning to spread through this, isn't there? Absolutely. I just think he's grasping, clutching at straws, trying to find anything outrageous to get airtime, to keep the story running on. But I think that part that you referred to, that the, the outcome is being set up to be seen as illegitimate if Hillary wins, just sets up so much anger and so much outcry afterwards that there is going to end up with a hugely divided society, which can only be a bad yeah. thing. Lucy, Toby, I deduce you don't agree on absolutely everything, but thank you both very much for an excellent paper review. I've been getting away with it all.